nation and tongue from generation to generation we worship you hallelujah hallelujah we worship you for who you Father, you are a good, good God. Thank you for bringing us here today. And Lord, we worship you. You are our creator. You are our keeper. So Lord, thank you for bringing us here and be with us as we worship together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that kind of got things started. I almost saw some people clapping and kind of like bouncing around again. So got some energy going. Hey, if you take your bulletins and open them up and take a look, there's a little sheet on the side you can rip off. And if you're new to our church, maybe put your name and phone number on there so that we can contact you. Uh, if you have prayer concerns, write them on there and we can uh, also uh, uh, be praying for you during um, the upcoming week. If you look in your bulletins, there's a lot of things going on from uh, True Care Mother's Day breakfast next Sunday. So 9 o'clock here at the church in the, the, uh, the fellowship hall, we're going to have uh, breakfast. So if you come at 9, get breakfast, and then church at 10, um, that'll be happening. The Renew gathering, and that's May 13th. That's still a, a little ways off. May 15th, um, so that's not this next Saturday, but the Saturday after, Donna Jensen um, her services are going to be here at uh, the church on Saturday, May 15th at 11 o'clock. And so come and uh, celebrate her life and uh, how she ministered to, to people in the community. But uh, we're going to do that service on Saturday, May 15th. And uh, I've got blue ribbons. And May 9th through the 15th is a way to just say to our law enforcement in the area, thank you, we appreciate you. Um, they're asking that you fly blue ribbons on your car. You can either put them on your antenna. Uh, a lot of cars don't have antennas anymore, so you can roll them up in the back window, but they're asking that for that week that you would fly a ribbon, so I have these available. See me after church, and I'll give you one. I also have magnets that uh, stick on the back of your car, but just a way to say thank you for law enforcement in our area for what they do and how they serve, and so that's a way. So you can pick up a ribbon this Sunday or pick one up next Sunday. And then this Friday and Saturday, uh, James Campbell's back home. He had a pretty extensive surgery on uh, uh, Wednesday of this last week, but he's back home, but his house is half painted. And so we're gonna have a paint party. Uh, if you wanna come and, and help with that and paint, uh, it's at James's house on Friday and Saturday. So if you're a willing body and you wanna uh, help with trimming or painting uh, Saturday and, or Friday and Saturday. Contact me if you want more information, but 
we'd love to have a group of people go over and finish his house for him because uh, he's going to be kind of laid up for probably about two months um, from this surgery. So uh, we want to really just give them a hand. They really don't have anything else. Um, oh, Dave? Do you want to use a mic? As many of you know, uh, our church has a great ministry of providing meals for those people in need. And uh, a couple of years ago, we had a nice list of people who were willing to help. Unfortunately, when we changed computers, I lost all my data. So I'd appreciate it if those who had signed up before signed up again, and of those who haven't been involved in that ministry, please take advantage of being, providing me with your name. We don't call on you very often, maybe once or twice a year if we have a long enough list, so I appreciate your help. And you can, even if you can't cook, you can do like Scott does, he just goes and buys a meal. So. That was kind of expensive, but I guess if I cooked, that would be too, but that worked for me. All right. David, you're going to read scripture for us. And it's my turn to say good morning. Welcome to Stanfield Baptist Church. Uh, this morning, we're going to read from Romans chapter 8, and we're going to start in verse 31. It's a beautiful passage from the Apostle Paul, um, and here we go. Give you a minute to turn pages. I hear some pages turning. It's okay. Electronic Bibles are okay too. If you like that. Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say to all these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We, regard, we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor anything present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much that we are more than conquerors through you, through your blood. We cannot be separated from Christ Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for, for your sacrifice, for your willingness to die on the cross for us, to make us in a place where we can have communion with you. And God, regardless of what we see coming down the, the pipe, Regardless of what we see in, in our society as we think about uh, 2 Thessalonians, uh, as we come, John shares later this morning, uh, and think about the, the trials and difficulties they had. And trials and difficulties we, we anticipate we may have, or we um, see our brothers and sisters around the world are dealing with. God, and all of that, we cannot be separated from you. Thank you for that beautiful, beautiful time. And God, now as we think about you, as we turn our hearts to you, as we worship through song, as we worship through uh, the hearing of your word and as we worship through communion later on. God, help us to see you well today, to honor you as we get to enjoy uh, being communion with you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand as we continue in our worship? My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter,
Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter.
God, as we come before you today, I'd ask that the ancient words would speak to you truly. Lord, the Holy Spirit would open our hearts and minds to that word today. As Pastor John delivers, I just ask that you would penetrate our hearts and our minds. Lord, change us from the inside out. We ask that in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is Children's Church in Holly and Banner back there. If you're third grade and under, follow them out those double doors. All right, well, good morning to you. Today we are in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And so if you have a Bible, please turn there with me. If you don't have a Bible, I would encourage you to grab one. You can probably find one underneath the row of chairs in front of you. And since we spend a lot of time in Scripture, it's good to have the words in front of you so you can see them. I can't give you the page number because I purchased a new Bible and it doesn't correspond to what you have. So I've got to figure out how to do that going forward. Um, I've got a Bible here. I, I've, I've got, had to go to larger print. It's, it's just, I've, I've been up here a few times of late and it's like, I'm okay, supposed to read that verse and I can't really read that. And that's a little awkward actually in the middle of a sermon. So I've got a bigger Bible up here and I've also got to train it to actually lay down. Second Thessalonians is you know, so far into the New Testament, I've, it's, I'm not, it's not like I've opened it up in the middle. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is our text, verses 16 and 17. So let me read these words to you. And then before we get into the passage itself, I want to make two observations that are not actually central to what Paul is saying, but they are observations coming directly from verse 16. And I just find them interesting, and so I want to talk about them briefly before we get into what's essentially a wish prayer. That's how we should understand these two verses. Paul is telling the Thessalonians, this is how I pray for you. This is what I desire for you from God when I pray for you. Let me read the text. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. So the two observations I want to begin with, first of all, it is remarkable to me how Paul is so willing to take the name of Jesus. He has the full expression of it in our text, the Lord Jesus Christ. And to attach that name to the name of Father God. 
and to put them on the same level, one with the other. And so I want to make some observations about that from verse 16, which have a significance to what we call the doctrine of Trinity, which is our understanding of who God is. I suspect there are not a lot of sermons preached today about the Trinity, and I suspect the reason that this is so is because in our contemporary Christian culture, deep doctrinal truths are basically suspect as to having any real value or validity to our lives. And it reminds me a book I read actually last week entitled The Consubstantial Trinity, written by Michael Haken. And I read this book primarily because it caught my attention, because when I was a doctoral student at Knox Seminary, Haken was one of my professors. And so when you encounter something written by someone you know, you're more inclined to read it. And so I ordered this book. It's not a long book, uh, 125 pages, but it's about the Trinity. And I went to this text this week to prepare this sermon, and I see things in verse 16. He, does, he doesn't mention this verse in his book, but there are things here about the Trinity. Now, one thing he does mention in his book, let me just backtrack for a moment. He, he talks about two church fathers, Irenaeus and Athanasius. Irenaeus, what an interesting man. He died around A.D. 200. He was a disciple of Polycarp. Polycarp was martyred for his faith as a very old man. Polycarp was a disciple of a man named John, who just happened to write several books of the New Testament, the Gospel of John and those three little epistles at the end of our New Testament. So when John was a very old man, John lived to a very ripe old age, Polycarp is a teenager set under John's teaching. And then when Polycarp was a very old man, Irenaeus set under Polycarp's teaching. So by the end of the first 200 years of the Christian church, here is a man, Irenaeus, who's got such a close connection to the beloved disciple of Jesus himself. And Irenaeus argued for the full deity of Christ in an age when that was being attacked. And, of course, that was connected to Trinity. The other mention in that book is Athanasius. Athanasius was a warrior. He was a battlefield theologian. He was a general. He was a pastor. He wasn't a guy who sat in an ivory chap or ivory tower someplace in what we call a seminary. He was a shepherd of souls. But he was tenacious for the orthodox understanding of the Trinity. And he was banished throughout his lifetime because of his belief a total of six times by the civil authorities. That reminds me of the fact that theology mattered to the ancients. If you got Trinity wrong, you could be banished. He got it right and he was banished. Arianism almost won the day, believe it or not, if you know what I'm referring to. Athanasius is the man who described the Trinitarian relationship between Father and Son this way. He said, we should think of the Father as being the eternal light. The one who brings light to this world. The one who brings life to this world. The uncreated one. He is the eternal light. And the Son is the eternal radiance of His Father's glory. In our text this morning, notice this. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father. Do you notice what's unusual about that statement? It's not unprecedented, but it is almost unprecedented in Paul's writing. It's the word order. The word order. Paul's normal approach, and we see it in the way that he begins the book of 2 Thessalonians. Let me just read to you the introductory verses, 
Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the normal order. The Father is first, and then the Son is mentioned second. But in this verse 16 of chapter 2, it's striking. Paul reverses that order. Perhaps the reason he does this is because, as we have seen, chapter 2 is about the glory of Christ, the second coming of Christ, the one who will come and rule and reign as God the Son over this world at some future day. And so Paul thinks it's appropriate and it's Trinitarian, it's significant to us. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father. In other words, Paul has no objection to listing Christ first. It's a statement of the authority of Christ, the dignity of Christ, the essence of who he is. The other observation I would make, which is not readily apparent in an English translation, but it is really quite fascinating. In verse 16, you have a plural subject, don't you? It is the Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father. Two different persons. The Son and the Father are mentioned, but then in the rest of the passage, all the verbs are singular. Greek is, an, is, a, is a language that reflects many different truths, and the verbs are singular. So what do we call that? There is a lack of subject-verb agreement, as we would think of it. To make this clearer to you, let me just read it this way. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, skip down to verse 17, may he comfort your hearts and may he establish them in every good work and word. We would expect to read it this way, may they comfort you, and may they establish you. But that's not how the Greek actually reads. It's a plural subject, but the verbs are singular. It's not unlike what you find at the end of Matthew's gospel in chapter 28, the baptismal formula where we are instructed that we are to baptize believers in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's not names, plural. It's names, singular. So in that text, there's three persons mentioned, but you are baptized in the, the name of these three persons. So in this text, where we would expect they, we have he. And all of this, again, it's not the major point that Paul is making this morning, but all of this is reminding us of the exalted position of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is not a God. He is the God. He is fully divine of one essence with his Father. Does that make sense? Is that beautiful? It really is beautiful to think that God the Father is the eternal light and God the Son is the eternal radiance of this God, the one who makes him known to us. And then to think of the incarnation, this great mystery of the eternal radiance of God coming into this world and taking to himself human flesh and being born of the Virgin Mary. It is a profound mystery. But people like Irenaeus and Athanasius, they fought tooth and toenail for these truths. But that should also encourage us. If you were in Sunday school this morning, you realize that we as Christians are living in difficult times and our culture is confronting us in various ways. That's nothing new. In these early centuries, there were difficult struggles and there were men and women of courage and conviction who stood up for God's truth. And we are simply called to do the same in our own generation. Now, let's begin to look at what Paul says in terms of this prayer. 
the God who's loved us from the beginning. That's the first major thought I want to draw your attention to. So verse 16, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us. I need to make another observation. The word loved here, the noun form of this is agape. You're familiar with that word, are you not? Greek has various words for love. Agape is this deep uh, thought of the unconditional love of God for his covenant people his great commitment to them, his covenant faithfulness to all of his promises. That's the verbal form that is found here, but it's also in the aorist tense. And that particular tense, its, its unique oddity of significance is that think of a period, like a dot. Imagine a blank piece of paper, and I'm trying to illustrate to you what the heiress signifies. It signifies a dot on that paper, and then an arrow coming out of that dot into the future. It's punctiliar. It draws attention to a particular moment of time in the past, and it says focus on that particular moment of time because something significant happened. Does that make sense? So we're being told here that God loved us, and he loved us in the past, and Paul has a specific moment, a specific event in mind, and so we ask the question, well, what moment would that be? And there are various suggestions, and none of them are wrong. All of them could be right. One of them is that he's thinking of the Incarnation. That moment when God the Son came into the world, when he humbled himself. Others say, well, he's thinking of the cross. Surely he's thinking of the cross. That moment when the Son who humbled himself, humbled himself unto death upon the cruel cross in order to redeem a people. And both of those are certainly legitimate possibilities, but I'm going to suggest to you that Paul has something different in mind something more fundamental, something that goes back even farther. And I'm basing that on the context of this passage, particularly going back to verse 13 and what we saw last Sunday. Let me read that verse to you with the variant reading that we talked about. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because from the beginning... God chose you unto salvation. I think that that is what Paul has in view here when he says, the Lord who loved us. He's going back into eternity past, and he's saying, this love that I have in view at this moment is the electing love of God whereby he chose a people for himself. I want to stop and think with you for just a moment about who this God is. Who is this God of the Bible? In fact, the words of the Bible matter, don't they? Because we're living in a culture where so many people have views of God, but they're not biblical views of God. I was talking to someone just the other day, or perhaps I read this, I don't remember, but they were talking to me about all the views of God current in our culture and how secular so many of those ideas truly are. This, this tendency that we have to strip away from God, to domesticate God, to defang or to declaw God. You know, you need to declaw a cat sometimes, although I'm philosophically opposed to it. But I've told you, I have this cat that I've adopted. I've got Calvin, who is the laziest, fattest cat in Stanfield, and is a pretty good pet. And I've got this other cat who lives under the barn. And this cat's wild, a feral cat. And I have over many, many, many months of great patience fed this cat morning and evening. And for a long time, I'd wear gloves. 
because I'd always try to pet it. Every day I tried to pet it. And then finally the gloves came off. But not as we normally think of that phrase, like the glove comes off, I'm going to kill the cat. No, I won the cat over. I still cannot pick the cat up. That would be a very dangerous thing to attempt. But I can pet the cat. I can rub its ears. Cats have claws. They can be dangerous. And so when I say we've domesticated God, what I, what I mean by that are we try to declaw God We've tried to take away from him, to strip him of glory, to make him more acceptable in our own eyes. And we dare not do that. So who is the God of the Bible? Just a couple of thoughts that I'll share with you. First of all, he is righteous. Isn't that true? I'll share a verse with you back in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Let me turn there in my brand new Bible with pages that stick, as Bibles tend to do. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 3 and 4. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect, for all His ways are justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is He. He is a just God. And he knows that we're not just, doesn't he? And that's the reason that Jesus came into the world, isn't it? To go to the cross as our substitute, to pay the penalty for our sins that we cannot pay ourselves. And to atone for those sins and then to offer us the righteous garment of Christ. He is just and we are not, but He makes a way for us, and so we should praise Him for that. Second of all, He is omniscient. What does that mean, to be omniscient? It's what I always thought my mother was growing up as a small child. She seemed omniscient at times. How did she always know what I was doing? like she had eyes in the back of her head. But she wasn't omniscient. Yes, omniscient means to be all-knowing, to be able to penetrate to the depth of everything, to realize that nothing is unknown of God, there's nothing murky in His mind. He is the all-penetrating One. He knows you through and through. But to also realize that as His children, if indeed you are His child through Christ, that this means that God knows every burden that you're bearing today. God knows every struggle. God knows every hurt. God knows everything in your life. And that's a great comfort to us, I believe. This is the God of the Bible. Thirdly, He is sovereign. The word sovereign means that God has all power and God has all authority. No one can ultimately resist the sovereignty of God. The Bible in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 33 says that the lot is cast into the lap. It's every decision is from the Lord. Again, though, this comforts us because we aren't sovereign, are we? And we aren't strong, are we? But God is strong, and God has us in His hands. Because through Christ, He is our God. And then fourthly, He's immutable. What does immutability mean? God means that God does not change in terms of His character, in terms of His purpose, in terms of His plans. That means that this God who is righteous will not Monday morning become unrighteous. 
It means this God who is omniscient will not wake up Monday morning as if God needed to sleep, and all of a sudden he has a senior moment or a senior day. He is the Ancient of Days after all, and he's forgotten something. Or this God who's sovereign at this moment will not cease to be fully sovereign in the future. This God who knows everything about us will continue to know everything about us. When you stop and think about it, these attributes, God is righteous and he's omniscient, he's sovereign, he's immutable. If you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, those attributes could be quite terrifying, couldn't they? But that's not our relationship with God. So go back to our text, 2 Thessalonians. I've got to make my way back to our text. Chapter 2 and verse 16. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us in eternity past this sovereign, omniscient, righteous, immutable God placed his love upon us. Now if you connect all of this to the context of 2 Thessalonians, which we've been trying to do week by week, and to remember that these were people who were shaken. These were people who were being persecuted. These were people who were being rejected by the elites of their culture. And so Paul comes along and he says to them, the culture might reject you, but the God of the Bible, the righteous, sovereign, immutable one, he loves you. He loves you in eternity past. Surely this should be a great comfort, not only to the Thessalonians, but by extension a great comfort to us. Is that a comfort to you? To realize that you are in the hands of this good, great, wise, sovereign God. And he says to you that through Christ, I am your Father. I don't know about you, but I don't know what news is better than that, honestly. This is news that should give us incredible comfort as we face whatever it is that we're facing in our daily lives. But Paul's not done. He continues. This is also the God who gives us hope for all of eternity. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. So God, it's all-inclusive, if you will. If you go on one of these trips, you know, to Mexico, it's all-inclusive, and you can just indulge yourself and overeat and all the rest. Everything's in the package that you purchase. I think of that. This is like an all-inclusive kind of idea, thinking about God's favor towards His children, because it begins in eternity past through election, but it continues into eternity future, in terms of this great hope that we have through Christ. You know, right now, if you want to go to visit someone in the hospital, or if you want to visit someone in uh, one of the retirement homes or living care facilities, they're, they're patrolling the doors. Have you noticed this? It's a jail if you're in there. Well, some of those restrictions are starting to loosen, but you're right, it was that way for many, many, many months. But I've been able to get into some of these facilities to visit a few people, but there's someone at the door, and they have a tool with them. Now, they want your personal information, and so you've got to give them your name and your phone number, and, you know, are you feeling ill today, and all the rest. But then there's this, there's this, there's this instrument they have. What am I thinking of? Yes, you know what I'm thinking of the digital thermometer, and they put that on your forehead and they tell you, you know, 
For me, it seems like 97.8. I'm a little cold-blooded, I guess. But then they let me in. And so that, that thermometer is an instrument that's, that's meant to measure something about me, right? They're trying to assess my health. I ask you this question this morning. If there was an instrument like that thermometer that could measure hope in your mind and in your soul this morning, what kind of a reading would it give us? Are you living out of this hope, this eternal hope that God has us in His hands and that He's taking us somewhere? Hope is a major theme in these two letters. I want to read the verses to you where this particular word appears. I've got them in my notes, so you can just listen as I read them. In chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, verses 2 and 3, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Or chapter 4 and verse 13, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. And of course, in that context, it's death that Paul is referring to. And I've got to tell you, in my role as a pastor for all these decades now, I am familiar with the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian when it comes to death. We're living in the age of the autonomous self. The age of self-rule. I don't need God. I'm my own God. Thank you very much. But you know, that all falls apart when you come to die. When all of a sudden you are staring in the face death and you realize that death has you in its jaws or it has your loved one in its jaws and I have been in the room where people have died and the unbelievers in that room they grieve like those who have no hope but I've also been in the room many times either the family or the person on the deathbed. And I have been encouraged in my own faith to listen to that person bear testimony to the grace of God in his or her life. I've seen them die as Christians. There really is a difference. And so Paul says to us, don't grieve like those who have no hope. Indeed, you will grieve. That's a natural process. But we don't grieve like unbelievers because we have hope. Or another reference. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Do you have the hope of salvation this morning? And then do you have the hope that, that comes out of that relationship? And I realize this is a more difficult reality. And I realize that we are struggling people in this world. But I'm asking you, like Mary herself, who pondered these things up in her heart when the angels announced the birth of Jesus and the significance of that birth, I'm asking you to ponder up these truths in your heart of who God is, of who Christ is, of what has been done for you, and to seek to allow that to fuel within you a living hope in a living God that extends not only into this life, but into the future life. And we've got to do that every day, don't we? To be in the Scriptures, to re- be reminding ourselves of these great truths. I'm going to read something to you. I-, I brought it up here uncertain as to whether I would read it, and I don't know. Maybe I'm making a mistake, but it wouldn't be the first time. This is on a podcast just the other day, and you got to stick with this to really get the point that he's making. Here's a man, and he's talking about just the, the monotony of life. 
and the difficulty of life, even a life that doesn't have a lot of problems. Because you know the house does break down. Got all those man jobs, which I feel so inadequate for. I'm a man, by the way. But I'm not good with the man jobs. After 34 years, our house is showing signs of age. My wife, who is more observant than me, they always are, recently noticed the ragged edges of the siding on our third-story dormers, evidence of water damage. I called a roofer, and in a day, it was stripped and replaced. Naked boards thrust against the sky still need the modesty of paint. I love that. He's a good writer, isn't he? The modesty of paint. But the house must be power washed first because we also want to have the trim painted and while we're at it, and that can't be scheduled for another month. I think my eyes just failed me. I skipped a sentence. I'm just going to keep reading though. Then we, I mean she of course, saw that water had also rotted the base of the frames around the two outside doors. The roofer was more than happy to replace them for a price. So everything's just falling apart, even my eyes. There are other signs, let's not mince words, decay, aging, entropy, cracks in the patio need filling, rooms need paint, well-tread carpet needs replacing. Wake up, buddy, don't own an old house. And that's the answer here. Why would you own a hundred-year-old house? I've been trying to get out of it for years. Windows stick and they won't open despite near hernia producing efforts. I've been there. And for some reason, despite my very limited plummeting skills, plumbing skills, the toilet gurgles randomly. Oh yes, the refrigerator fans, motor complains, the floors creak. The air conditioner fails at an inopportune time. The fireplace needs cleansing or it just won't light. Those electric ones, I'm frustrated by that. A pipe bursts under the front lawn. Cracks have appeared in the driveway. That's just for starters. If you are a homeowner, all of this will sound familiar. Mind you, this stuff happens over the years and it keeps happening. Confronted by such entropy, some people just move on to a new or newer home. What a, what a wise thought. Some with money remodel every four years to freshen up. I don't mind a facelift, but I still want to be in the same place when the lift is over. Others spend their Saturdays maintaining and fixing every sag and seepage, every crack and crumble. They make me so tired. Still others put their finger in the dike and, play a, and pray a lot because the swell of the left undone is rising. Barbarian elemental forces of nature are at the door. I love his reference to the barbarians who took down the Roman Empire. But me, I'm plotting the resurrection. I don't want to spend my days keeping up I would rather be with my wife and visit my children, lay in the hammock or sit under the blue umbrella and think and listen to the trees sway and the, the squirrels chatter and watch the robins and the wrens and the cardinals that visit. We take a few precautions, of course. We did have the siding repaired. It's unlikely the house will fall down around us. We just kick at the creeping to-do list until it bleeds daylight. There's plenty of that, of course, because it's not just a house, but a home. For now, I want this house, but I want it redeemed and I want it made imperishable. I want it to be one in which the paint never fades, the walls never crack, where the memories of life are muraled all over its rooms and where it glows in the golden light of the late afternoon sun that never ends. The house beyond the house. The house that was meant to be. All the good in it perfected. I'm waiting for the day when all things are made new, even this house. Was that worth reading? 
ultimately, that's what Paul is directing us to in this text when he says that this God who loved us in eternity past has given us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. And then he finishes verse 17 with these words, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. So the way to understand this paragraph is to think about time. Paul begins in eternity past, past tense, and then he takes us into eternity future, future tense, And he does this for the purpose of bringing us right now into this moment in which we find ourselves. And he says, in view of all of this, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. This word comfort is used in ancient Greek literature of the general or the king who encourages and inspires his troops on the very edge of battle. Have you seen the Lord of the Rings movies? In that second movie where the king of the horsemen, I don't remember his name. Any Lord of the Rings fanatics here today? You know what I'm talking about? He's on his horse, and they're about to go into battle, and he has his sword raised high, and he's, he's, he's riding down the line, and his, horse, his sword is hitting the spears and the swords of all of his warriors. And he's encouraging them as they're going into a seemingly impossible situation. That's the word used here. Let these truths comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. In other words, Paul is saying May the truth of God's word strengthen you for living as a Christian in this world. For living with deep conviction. For not giving up. There's a real call in this text to be godly men and women. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, I do thank you for the word of God. I thank you that it is a living word. And I pray, Lord, that it has spoken to us this morning. And I pray that it will continue to speak to us as we live in this world through the rest of this new week. I thank you for the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We give glory to you today. We ask your blessing upon the remainder of our service as we have the opportunity to celebrate the Lord's table, to remember the gospel, the work of Christ, dying on the cross for our sins. So may your spirit continue to minister to us and speak to us in these coming moments. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. as we sing our closing song.
seated. 